I am Holly, Pastor Ken's wife, for those of you who may not know me. I was just thinking, there are so many new faces in the house that I, I mean, I might get to hug you when you come in, but I really don't know much about you, and you probably don't know much about me. So just a quick snippet, Ken and I have been married now for 34 years. So that's pretty amazing. Um, he's not too hard to live with, just like I'm not too hard to live with. So we found a way to make it work, thanks to Jesus. Um, and so um, God's just been very, very good. We have three children, and they are 29, 27, and 25. And one lives here. She's married to our amazing Pastor Josiah, our daughter Heather, who is pregnant with baby number three. You guys see the other two running around in here, and I am now no longer Holly at Lighthouse. I am Mimi. So, um, and they're such a joy. And that our middle daughter, Alyssa, is married to Matt Mason, and they live in Tennessee, and they have a little one that's turning two the early part of November. So I will not be here then. I will be there to celebrate a birthday. Um, and then our youngest son, Jeremy, is um, in Charlottesville with his girl who is a nurse at the uh, Uvea Hospital there. So it's awesome to have brought our kids up in this house. For those of you who don't know, this is my church that I grew up in. And the Lord was, you guys took me back. That's what amazes me, is you took me back and let me be a pastor here and be a part of what God was doing in this place. I tell people, you guys grew us up. Um, in the faith. You guys grew us up in the things of the Lord. You grew us up into maturity. Um, you stuck with us through a lot of yucky stuff, and you guys stuck with us when we were stupid. That is amazing, too, that you still kept us and didn't kick us out um, over some of the stuff that we did. But God is so full of grace, and you guys have been so full of grace. So it's an honor to be here this morning and to just be with my family. You guys are my family. Doesn't matter how long you've been here or how short you've been here. You are now family. Um, and that's why I stand at the back and try to hug as many of you, even those who don't like hugging. You, you, you give me grace and you still hug me, and I thank you. But it's really truly because I feel that this is family to me. My mom and dad are now in heaven. I have a brother that's in heaven. You guys are my family. Um, and so thank you for loving us. Thank you for letting us be a part of your lives for all of these years. And that's my brother over there, one co that comes here. Daniel, wave your hand, my brother. He's awesome. He's a great encourager to me. So I, I love him, and I'm glad he's here. All right, so today, you guys, we're starting a new series. You know we ran a series on communion, the Lord's Table. Um, and taking that from just a monthly activity that we do here at Lighthouse to something much deeper and much richer um, in truth and in practice, hopefully, for our lives. Um, I just heard of a family the other day who was taking communion on, they said, we're going to take communion uh, tonight. And somebody else said they were taking, I think SSL took it yesterday um, during their class. And somebody else was telling me they're taking communion as a family tonight. So I love that, that we've taken communion from just a Sunday morning activity to something that has great value and depth in our lives and in our family. So today we're going to start um, a new series, and we're going to talk about a season called In the Meantime. Now, in the meantime means during the time before something happens or before a specific period ends. Now, Ken and I are in a, in a meantime. We are in a season before something happens, uh, in the, I call it the middle, the middle place, the messy middle. It could be the messy middle, it could be the in-between, or it could be the in the meantime for you. But we ended a season with our home and where we'd lived for, I don't know, how many years did we live there? 13, 14, something like that. Um, sold our house. You guys know we, we live in an RV, and I know you think we've lost some marbles. Um, but that's okay. We're trying to lean in to hear what the voice of the Lord is saying in this. And for us, it was let go of some things to get ready to hold some new things. And you know, sometimes you have to learn to let, to hold things really loosely and not hold them tight. Because when you hold them tight, either he has to pry your fingers open for them, or he says, if you don't want to give it to me, I can't, I just won't be able to give you the new thing. And I don't ever want to miss the new thing that he has in the season. So he said, let go of some things, we let go of some things, and now we're in the season of saying, okay, what's this next gonna look like? We're in an in-between time. 
It's not a bad in-between time, but we don't have all the answers and we don't have all the picture and we don't know all the hows and we don't know all the whys yet. We're in a meantime. I don't know. Maybe you're in an in the meantime as well or an in-between place or a season, what you would call the messy middle of life, um, God's got a word for you today. And so I'm excited to share with you about a man in the Bible who found himself in an in-between time, in a mean time, and that was Gideon. So I want you to look with me at Judges chapter 6. Just so you guys know, I have set an alarm on here because I always talk too much and too long. So it's going to go off, and that's going to be my wind it down, Holly, so you guys have grace, because I cannot, I cannot talk and look at the clock at the same time. It always messes me up. So um, you guys, there are a lot better preachers in this house than me. I am not really a preacher. I am more of a teacher, um, and I love to dig for the nuggets in the Word and the riches in the Word. And so when I take a portion like what we're going to talk about in Judges 6 and 7, you can probably find it on an online Bible if you have it, if you didn't bring your Bible with you today. Also in the the Bible, the YouVersion app that we use here for you to um, get any content or information. Also your notes are in there. Um, We don't have it up here. Oh, there you go. So you guys can actually scan that, I guess. I don't really know how all this works, but you can scan. I have it on here. I usually have to say, Ken, do I have to do another app? I hate putting apps on my phone. Anybody else hate putting apps on their phone? Okay, so thank you. I'm not the only one. There was was very few of us that actually raised our hands for that, so maybe we're the minority. Um, But anyway, so you can find that on on there. So what I want to do with you today is I want to just read through this passion, this, this um, portion of scripture about Gideon. And I want to talk to you about some of the things that the Lord is showing us through his story um, that may apply to where you're at today. I'm a firm believer that whenever the word comes forth, I can in no way, shape, or fashion know where you're at in your life. I can't, I can't know that. I know a few stories, but I don't know your story probably. But the Holy Spirit knows exactly where you're at, knows your story. So he's going to take the word today, and he's going to apply it right where you're at. Because he loves you, and he cares for you, and he has something for you today that will strengthen you, encourage you, uplift you, help you to shift, help you to give stuff up, set you free, lift you up, bless you. He's got something for you today. So let's invite him to speak to us. Holy Spirit, we invite you today to speak to us through your word. Let our hearts be open. In fact, I sense that there are many in this room today that are hungry for something from you. They're thirsty. Their souls are thirsty, and they need something that's going to bring life and fruitfulness and hope. So, Lord, let your word do that today for them. Holy Spirit, take it. Like you shoot an arrow at a target, and you hit a bullseye every time. Hit the bullseye in hearts today, I pray. And we give you all the glory for it in your name. Amen. All right, so let's look at the story of Gideon and Judges. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites... Amalekites and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Now, just a little bit of a backstory. This is Israel's history, is disobey the Lord, get themselves in a hard place where the enemy comes in and wreaks havoc. Then they repent, turn back to the Lord, and he sets them free. And then the cycle continues over and over and over again in the Israelites' life. I would like to think that if I was there back then, 
that I would not repeat that same mistake over and over again, that I would be rescued by Jesus, and I would be set on a straight path, and I would not turn from him again. But so far, my life has not proven that that would be the full totality of every decision that I would make. Anybody else been there? So now the reality is, if I was walking in that same place, Jesus, would I do the same silly things over and over and over again? That you rescue me, you set my feet on a solid place, and then yet I turn from you in confidence, in faith, and move towards doubt and fear and anxiety and stress that causes me to make poor decisions, and lo and behold, I'm back at the same, another place, just another time, another mountain, another molehill, whatever it might be. The Israelites repeated this cycle. But Jesus, in his grace, provides a way out. But the way out comes through hardship. Because it's the hardship that causes them to cry out for his help. Now, we want to run from hardship. We want to run from hardship every time. But Jesus knows exactly what it takes in our lives to make us say, Uncle Stop twisting the arm. I give it to you, Jesus. So while we want to run from hardship, God is doing something in the midst of it because he wants to reveal himself to the Israelites. So the Israelites are in a very difficult position. The enemy is coming in and stripping and raping the land, taking everything out of the land so that they become destitute and have nothing it's a very desperate situation. In fact, it's so bad. I imagine there's some killings going on. There are some physical threats to people in addition to not having any livestock to, to, to multiply out of or to even eat. There's no grain. There's, no, there's very little of anything. They are literally going to starve. The enemy is trying to get rid of them through starvation and death. And so some go and hide and make homes in the caves and in the rocks to try to get away from it. And some are still here in this place. And this is where we find Gideon. So it says, When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. I delivered you from the hand of all of your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I imagine he was reminding them, don't you remember when you were slaves in Egypt and I brought you out and I rescued you and I took out every horse and rider with the sea and killed them all and set you free and sent you into your promised land. And I drove out your oppressors before you so that you could inherit your promised land. And he said, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. So here is the why that the Israelites are experiencing what they've experienced. How quickly they forgot what God did for them to rescue them out of their last place so that now they're in this place because they've forgotten what the Lord their God did for them. The angel of the Lord came and sat down. Here we come to the, the scenery changes, and here we get to meet Gideon. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in, in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Interesting thing. Gideon, a man who has come up now as one of the Israelites, the Bible doesn't tell us how old he is, but he's, he is living in an environment where they have chosen not to worship the one true God. Actually, they do worship him, but they're now polytheistic. They serve many gods. They've accepted the gods that are all around them. So they have a, a, a Baal idol that sits outside the home. They have an um, a Asherah pole that sits outside there, which is a goddess of fertility. And they worship the Baal that they say is the Lord of heaven and earth. 
because he's the one who brings their crops and gives rains to their crops. Well, we see how well that's working out for them. And then the, they're, they're worshiping the God of fertility. Uh, these, these idols are sitting outside. So Gideon has come up in this environment of seeing how there's this mixture of we can worship God some, but we're also worshiping these other gods. This is our culture that we live in today, actually, very much our culture, um, that God exists and we can call on him, but there are other things we're going to give our lives to. It's not just going to be God. We're going to give our lives to other things. So Gideon is subject to what's happening in his culture and actually what's happening in his own home because these idols are sitting outside his home. His father has put them there. And so Gideon, in all of this, is trying to make something, bring forth some harvest in a place that was never designed to bring forth harvest the way he's trying to harvest it. Midian is trying to thresh wheat in a wine press. Now, threshing wheat happens in a wide open area on a, on a large floor where it's beat down or it's rolled over with wheels and it's thrown up into the air so the wind could blow away the chaff. You need a lot of room for this. And Gideon is hiding, trying to thresh wheat in a hole in the ground that's their wine press. You see what's happening here? He's trying to make something in a place that it was never designed to be made. Sometimes in our lives, we get our, find ourselves in a place where we're trying to make something in a place in a way it was never designed for. We're trying to use tools that we can't use tools right to accomplish the work. Maybe you even say, I find myself in that place because the enemy has stripped away and ravaged my life. He's stripped away and he's ravaged my marriage. And I find myself in a wine press, and I'm not supposed to be in the wine press. The place that was supposed to bring fruitfulness has become a place of despair. Sometimes in our, in our in-between time, in our meantime, we find ourselves in places we were not meant to be. And we're using tools we were never tried, meant to try to use, and we're trying to work in spaces that were never designed for what we ha- God has given us. And that's where Gideon finds himself. Now, I wonder if some of it wasn't even Gideon's fault. Some of you today have found yourself in a wine press, and it was not your fault. You didn't choose to be there. But there you are. But let me tell you something. Guess what? The angel of the Lord found him in that wine press. He knew exactly where he was. He was not hidden from God. God knew that he was in that wine press, trying to make something out of a place that was not designed for something to come forth out of. It was a place for the grapes to bring forth a harvest of wine and fruitfulness, not a place to thresh the wheat to eat. But yet here's Gideon, and some say he was hiding, and that made him a coward, maybe, But I don't see Gideon having run to the caves. I see Gideon who said, I will deal with the place that I have to do this for my family. If I have to be here, I'll do it. I'll do the best I can until something happens. But I believe that it was probably a place of hopelessness. Because who is going to set us free and change this circumstance? They're crying out for God, but this had been seven years. Seven years they had been ravaged, and the enemy was wreaking havoc and stealing and destroying. Some of you have been years the enemy has been stealing from you. The Lord's going to call you out of that wine press place today. He's going to call you out of that place where the enemy's been stealing and raping and pillaging from your life, from your family's life, from your finances From your situation, he's going to pull you out. He knows exactly where you're at. You are not hidden from him. And today he's going to call you out of that wine press. You're not going to have to stay there any longer. God sees you. There's a word for that. There's a name for God in that called El Roy, the God who sees me. There's another person in the Bible, only one place I believe that that name is mentioned. um, And that's with the, the Egyptian servant Hagar. 
who was the servant to Sarah and Abraham, Sarah's servant. And when Sarah could not get pregnant, the custom of the day, and I'm not saying it was God's custom, but the custom of the day was to give the maid servant to the husband so that the family line could continue. And when Sarah could not get pregnant, she said, I'm going to give you Hagar, and I want you to get her pregnant so that her baby can be mine and continue the lineage. And when Hagar got pregnant, Something began to stir in her about the, the unfairness of this and the misery of it. And she became, began to, to react to that towards Sarah, and Sarah cast her out. And she went out into the desert and sat down by a stream, all by herself, without anybody with her, pregnant and in a mess. And Jesus came to her and said, I see you sitting right there, and I have a promise for you. The Lord has a promise for you today. If you're sitting in the desert and you feel like you're by yourself and you don't know how in the world you can get out of this situation and the place that you're in, he comes to you in that and he says, I see you. I am your El Rai. I am the God who sees you. And I have a promise for you. And God fulfilled that promise for Hagar. Even though She wasn't meant to be in the place that she was, and it wasn't her fault that she got there. God had a promise for her, and he brought it to pass. God sees you. He realizes just where you are. Genesis 16, 13 is that reference to Hagar, if you want to write that down. Then the next one is, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, and he said to him, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. God calls you. He calls you, but you know what? He doesn't just call you by name. And we know he knows your name because the Bible tells us that. He has your name written down on him. And the Bible also tells us he knows how many hairs of head, how many hairs you have on your head. So that's pretty cool. Um, Some of you wish you had more hairs on your head. Some of you wish you had less. I get that. Um, You could take that up with Jesus later. Tell him you'd like to increase that number of hairs on your head. But he calls you, but what we see here with, Midian, or with Gideon is that he called him by a name Gideon had never heard. A name he never associated with himself. He called him something that he could not see for himself, but God saw. He said he, he called him a mighty warrior. That angel of the Lord, when he came, was bringing a message from the Lord that I, don't, I am going to call forth out of you what you cannot yet see for yourself. I'm going to call it out of you. Today, Jesus is calling out of you some things that you will not call yourself. But he says, I see it in you, and I'm going to call it forth because it is not just for you. It is for your children. It is for your spouse. It is for your neighbors. It is for your workplace. It is for a nation that I call you what you may not have heard before. So Jesus, do it today. Call some of them in this room today by something they've never heard before. Call them out, Jesus. He calls you. When he calls you, you have to follow his instruction. Luke 9, 23 says, Then he said to the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Here's what I think is cool as we look at this. Gideon says, pardon me, my Lord, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? I imagine he probably did that double take thing. Can you imagine what mighty, mighty warrior? Pardon me, my Lord, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Here's what I think is cool is he didn't even, he did not even give one ounce of an answer to that complaint. How many of you are with me? Oh God, why have you done this? Why God? Why am I here? Why is this happening? Why did this happen to me? Why did you let this happen to me? We are of the why camp. And the angel of the Lord did not even give a second to that. It was like, uh, move on. 
I got something coming. Move on. He's got something coming. Move on. Don't stay in your why. Now, I think it's pretty significant that Gideon was able to let it go and move. Because many times, especially when you come from a place that Gideon did, where he's sitting in a place of hopelessness and despair, and he's watched the enemy steal, kill, and destroy their lives all around him. And yet he walks out of this without wound, without bitterness, and without a vision that could not see where God was moving and going. Now, you know, recently I had to go to the eye doctor and, you know, renew my, my eye check up here because some sight is changing a little bit more. I wear contacts, for those of you who don't know. I probably worn contacts since I was 12 years old. That's a long time to be wearing contacts. But as I'm getting my eyes checked and the eye doctor says, okay, so this eye, um, there is, there's some, some change in this eye. Your astigmatism is growing worse in this eye. And so we're going to have to adjust your contact to fit your eye differently. And they do that now. Isn't that cool? In fact, you can get actually bifocal contacts, which I have not tried yet. But um, if anybody done that, you could talk to me afterwards and tell me what that's like. Um, but so, so he said, did anything ever happen to your eye? And I said, yeah, actually, that eye um, had a trauma to it when I was probably 18, 19, out playing football in the yard. And the football, I missed it. And it hit me directly in the eyeball, the edge, the end of it hit me directly in the eyeball. And he said, so what happened? I said, well, I lost the vision in that eye. Um, and I freaked out. I thought maybe mud got in my eye. So I went in, checked in the bathroom mirror at my friend's house, no mud in the eye. Um, and so I just, I was praying like crazy at that, mo that moment and then came back to half sight and then probably after another five minutes, regained full sight again. But, of course, sore, the whole thing. So he said, yep, a trauma like that can do it. He said, it has adjusted your vision. Trauma can adjust our vision. So some of us sitting in the room have been through traumatic situations and circumstances, and it has adjusted our vision. And so now I have to wear contacts that fit my vision. But Jesus doesn't want to give you something that fits your vision. He wants to heal your vision. He wants to change your vision. Gideon had to let Jesus change his vision from what he'd been seeing for seven years to see what God was going to do without carrying all that trauma with him without carrying the woundedness with him of having to pillage and be in a pit of despair that was meant for fruitfulness for seven years, he had to let God heal something there. And I'm going to show you where it happens. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that this is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat from an ephah of a flower. He made bread without, I'm not probably mispronouncing stuff. Y'all forgive me. I should have John, I should have John and, um, um, John come up here and help me with my, uh, pronunciation of some of these words. He made bread without yeast, putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot. He brought them out and offered them to him under the oak tree. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it 
the Lord is peace. I believe it was at this place that the Lord healed right there. All of that stuff that Gideon had experienced. All of the trauma, all of the hurt, dealt with the fear. Now, that doesn't mean fear does not come back around to be dealt with. But I believe he released him of some things when Gideon said yes, even though he had nothing to offer. But when he said his yes, and he brought his altar, his, his uh, gift to the altar, it represents the gift of his own life to bring it and give his yes. And at that place of yes, Jesus healed. Because then he says that he has peace. The peace has come. It's at that altar of consecration where you say, God, I see that you want to do something in this meantime, in this in-between time, in this messy place that my life is at. You want to do something. So, God, I am bringing myself to you as the offering. For Gideon, he brought the bread and the, and the, the meat and the broth. But for you, it's your heart and your life and your yes. And it's at that place that he heals and he takes out the wounds. Hebrews 12 talks about, um, in, in the Passion Translation, um, letting go of every weight that so easily besets us from running our race. But in the Passion Translation, it likens it to an arrow, arrow tips that are stuck in your back. Those arrow tips stuck in your back will slow down what God wants to do in your life. Can you today, at the altar of consecration, say your yes to Jesus and let him take the arrow tips out? Whatever those wounds are, people have hurt you, they've wounded you physically, mentally, emotionally, they've misunderstood you. You've been pressed down. You've been pillaged. The enemy has destroyed and kicked you around. Let him take out the arrow tips today so you can say yes and run that race that he has for you. So then, says the same night the Lord said to him, sorry, that the Lord said to him, peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there, called it the Lord is peace. To this day, it stands in Ophrah of the Abbey's right. That same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height. Using the wood of the pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a bull burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 of his servants, did as the Lord told him, but because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. And in the morning when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished with the pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. What are the idols? What are the idols that you need to pull down and tear down? And you need to say, I may have come up this way. This might be the generation I was brought into, but it's become an idol and the Lord wants to tear it down. Holy Spirit, reveal today idols that you want to tear down. Tear down idols. What are the idols that you want to lay on the altar today? There's an idol to be torn down, and there's an altar to be built. And you take that idol, and you lay it on the altar with Jesus. And it's out of that place that becomes the commissioning to step in. There's a place of consecration where you give your yes, and you say, here I am, Jesus. I give you all. And then there's a place of commissioning where the, altar, the idols are torn down and laid on the altar before him. And now he's ready to send you. He's ready to do the work. He's ready to accomplish. And he told Gideon to start with the strength you have. You know, Hebrews 13, 20 to 21 says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever Amen. And 2 Corinthians 12, 9, 
My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. You see, Gideon was not able to come to this place of commissioning with anything of his own to offer. He had nothing that he could offer to go and fight the Amalekites and the Midianites and see what God would do. He had nothing that he could offer God except himself, and that was all God needed. That was all he needed was the yes and the willingness to follow instruction, to tear down idols, to build an altar, and to say yes. And then God was going to do the work. So we trust God at that place to clothe us with power. He is with us. His strength, his power, his authority is put on us, and it covers up us. And Philippians 4, 12, and 13 says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Gideon was promised to be clothed with the Lord's power. If he would give his yes, the Lord would clothe him and would do the work for him. And so then he said to him, don't lean on your own understanding in this. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd. I'm going to skip this. Is that okay with you guys? Because we're running out of time. The spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. I'll skip back up a little bit. Now all the Midianites, Amalekites, and all the eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abiezrites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, and also to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet him. And Gideon said to, them, to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. So now Gideon dealt with his fear of what the enemy had done and stole and taken away, gave his yes, been commissioned by the Lord, and now doubt begins to creep back up again. I love what God does. He's so faithful to us in our humanness when we need a sign from him, when we need him to speak to us. He's so faithful to help us to see what he wants to do. So Gideon, in his doubt, says, I'm going to lay before you uh, this fleece, and would you show me through this fleece? Once would you make it wet when the ground is dry, and once would you make it dry while the ground is wet? And two times the Lord answers him to give him the confidence and instill and clothe him with what he needs to do the work that he's calling him to do, to go and to lead a nation into victory. God is so faithful to us. When we're seeking him, which way do we turn, God? What is it that you're speaking to us? He's so faithful to give us what we need. Don't be afraid to ask him. Don't be afraid to ask him for him to give you a sign to go the direction that he's calling you to do. God doesn't always do it that way. Your whole life walking with him. He changes it up sometimes. And sometimes he bolsters and encourages you. And sometimes he tells you to walk out, walk it out in faith. But he's always faithful in his clothing you with power. So don't lean on your own understanding. Out of this situation, Gideon says, okay, I hear from you. So I'm going to blow the shofar. I'm going to blow the trumpet and they're going to come and we're going to fight. So all of the Israelites, the fighting Israelites, the mighty men of God, who have been hiding in the caves, hiding in their towns, come out to join with what God is doing. They come out to participate. And God looks at that, that crowd of mighty men, hundreds of thousands, and says, it's too many. It's too many. We're not going to go into battle with this because I know exactly what will happen. You'll walk out of that victory and you'll say it is because it was the strength of our hands. And he says, I will not do it that way. So I want you to tell everybody in this crowd that is afraid, if there's any fear, to turn and go home. And so tons, hundreds of thousands go home. 
And then the Lord looks across that group that's left and he says, it's still too much. I know, I know these people. They're my people and I know the depth of them and I will not let them do it this way because it will destroy them. Not destroy their lives, but it'll destroy their hearts because they'll take the glory for themselves and they cannot take the glory for themselves. They cannot live with the glory. I have to live with the glory. It is my glory. So then he says, now take them down to the river, to the stream, and I want you to separate them by who laps with their hand and who kneels to drink. And so the Lord separates them again till it's simply 300 men left standing. Now this is where I'm going to do my work. Why does God choose to do things that are so crazy sometimes? Now, Gideon at this point could have said, there is no way, absolutely not. I cannot lead this army. I'm going to run and I'm going to go the other way because it did not look the way he thought it would look. I know when Gideon said, I will lead this. I will lead the army, God, to defeat them. We will do this. Let's go do this. And then God leaves him with 300. God, this does not look anything like I thought it would look. Sometimes when God brings us out of those hard places and he's bringing us from in the meantime and in between time or a messy place, it does not look the way we thought it would look. And we want to keep turning around and saying, God, I've got to, I've got to wait here. I've got to stay here until you make it the way I thought it was going to be. I got it right here. I know what this is supposed to look like. I know what an army fighting this many in battle needs to look like, God, and you're not giving that to me. But Jesus, once again in his goodness, gives him a confirmation when he goes down to the side of the camp, the Midianite, Amorite camp, Amalekites, and he listens, and he hears about a dream that, they, that someone on that side had. And in that dream, being spoken brings a confirmation and a faith building to Gideon that God has it just where it needs to be. Now you're going to go in faith. Trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. You may find that you fit in that category of weak, foolish. It doesn't matter. That's exactly what he's looking for. He's looking for you to come and say, I don't know that I have anything to offer for what you want to do in my life and through my life. God says, good, you're right where I want you. You are right where I want you. Because then anything that can be done will be all for my glory and none of yours. And that's right where I want you. So then Gideon had to take the last and the final step, which was to follow the instruction of the Lord and take the earthen vessels with a torch inside of them for each man and a trumpet or shofar for each man and to separate into three groups of a hundred each, and to go around. And he said, this is all I want you to do. What I find interesting there is he never said, pick up a sword. He said, pick up a clay vessel with a light inside. You are a clay vessel with a light inside. That he wants to use to send the enemy scattering. And in that... And the blowing of that trumpet, as soon as the obedience, the full obedience to break open those clay vessels so the lights should shine and the shofars are blown and the, and the yell out for the Lord and for Gideon, the Bible tells us that the enemy began to fight themselves and scatter and run. And then you can read on throughout Judges and see the rest of the story and everything that happens. And you will find that Gideon makes some mistakes and he messes some things up down the line. Hello, welcome to my club. 
But what I think is cool is that Gideon's life is written in Hebrews as one of the great men of faith because he said a yes to Jesus. And he came out of a place where he was in a pit of despair, a place of, um, that was meant for fruitfulness, that God brought him out and brought victory. And nothing that God did was just for Gideon, though I believe that he did work in Gideon. But it was for a generation and for a nation. And it was for us because we're telling his story and we're seeing what he did. God wants to do something with your story to impact your family, to impact your generations, and to impact this nation and this world. He wants to bring you, those of you who are in the wine press, out of what was supposed to be a place of fruitfulness where you have been struggling to produce something. He wants to call you out of that place and restore fruitfulness back. For those of you who've been walking wounded, you've been walking with your sight off, your vision off because of trauma, he wants to heal your eyesight today, your spiritual eyesight. And some of you are just living through stuff. And Ken, he's going to come up and he's going to pray with us. Some of you are just living with stuff that was not your fault, but it's because of the generation that made decisions for you and that you're walking in. We call those generational curses. And the Lord breaks generational curses. Those things do not have to continue in your life. God was not going to let seven years continue in the lives of the Israelites at that stage. But he was looking for a man who would say yes. He was looking for a, he's looking for a woman who will say yes. God, do it in me. Do it in me. And he will impact a nation. And he will impact a generation. And he will impact a family. And he will impact a marriage. And he will impact you. Would you stand with us?